Heavenly Father, please be with us as we open your word. Uh, pray that you'll give us a fresh insight into what you're saying here. Uh, help us to appreciate that when you speak to us, uh, it's an extraordinary privilege uh, that you, the creator and sustainer of this universe, would care to reach out and connect with us. And we ask that uh, in hearing you today, uh, you'll shape our lives, uh, that you'll strengthen our hearts, that you'll move us uh, to repentance if there are areas that we need to change, that we'll be willing to seek forgiveness uh, and that we'll be uh, looking to reorient our lives with Jesus at the centre. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I imagine that um, these last few verses uh, of Matthew's Gospel are familiar to us. Um, how, how many people would have thought of these verses as the Great Commission? Most of us, I think. And many of us would have heard these verses kind of on their own, perhaps, detached from the rest of uh, Matthew, not necessarily having a context from the beginning right through to the end. And I want to put them back into context today. I actually want to have a look at uh, Matthew chapters uh, 20, uh, 28, sorry, verses 16 to 20, not just as a statement that stands on its own that you would put on the wall, the Great Commission, uh, but as the climax and the conclusion to Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and when you think about it, in so many ways, it does bring a natural conclusion to the things that we've seen. Uh, if you go back, and I'm just going to take you on a quick tour of Matthew's Gospel, we began this, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, I think it might have been the year before. Uh, we noticed that in the very outset, Jesus is put into history. Now, there's a family tree from the beginning, and it's no ordinary family tree. You've got Abraham as a key figure. You've got David as a key figure. You've got the Babylonian exile as a key event. And the point is made that Jesus comes in the line of David. And right through the first few chapters of Matthew's Gospel, again and again, we're told, and this fulfills what was said in the Old Testament. So from the beginning, we're told that Jesus enters into history and that he comes in fulfilment to the promises that God had made, especially to Abraham and to David. And we see at the end of Matthew's Gospel, and I think we probably looked at this on Christmas Day uh, a couple of years ago, that Jesus comes with two names, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Uh, the name Jesus is the, the kind of the anglicised Greek form of Yeshua or Joshua, meaning the Lord saves. And he also has the name given to him there, Emmanuel, which means God with us. So as you read through the Gospel, the expectation of one who comes fulfilling the promises of God, who has the name the Lord saves, who is God with us, is that you'll see these things impacting our world, and we do. Uh, Jesus meets with extraordinary bunches of people right through the gospel. But the key event and the key person that he meets with, uh, quite surprisingly, is a guy who's called John the Baptizer. Uh, he meets his cousin, John, out at the Jordan River. Uh, John is baptizing, he's washing people in the Jordan River. They're, it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. He's calling people to get right for the coming of the one after him, who is Jesus. And Jesus submits to that baptism. Um, he goes through that cleansing, not because he needed to be cleansed, but identifying with sinful people. And at that event, and this I think is significant, you get a picture of the Trinity at work. You get the voice from heaven, this is my son whom I love, listen to him, God the Father. You have Jesus in the water and you have the Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. We'll come back to that. Uh, as you go on, Jesus then proclaims a message. Uh, in chapter 4, he says this, To fulfill Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, I just want you to keep that phrase in mind, Galilee of the Gentiles. That is not Jews, Galilee of the nations, uh, all the people who are not part of the covenant people of God. 
The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, turn around, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then we see him um, gathering some followers. Uh, first of all, a couple of fishermen and then a bunch of other people. And we discover after a while that there's 12 of them. And he calls them disciples. Again, this is an important word, the word disciple. It literally means a student, uh, one who learns from the teacher. And Jesus is known as a teacher. Um, perhaps less a student in the academy sense that we have today and maybe more a student in the kind of apprenticeship sense, one who will follow after the master and be taught by him and do the things that he does. Well, as we read on, we see that Jesus gathers his disciples and probably the most famous episode of his teaching in three chapters of Matthew's Gospel is what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And there are many perspectives that you can look at this sermon with, but just to remind us that there is a sense of fulfilment going on. And Jesus spells out that no matter how many uh, promises there were in the Old Testament, no matter how much there is in the Law and the Prophets, he hasn't come, rid to, come to get rid of any of it, but he's come to fulfil it. And you'll only understand what's come before Jesus, therefore, if you've got that last piece of the puzzle... Um, you, you've probably had the experience of going through a jigsaw on a rainy week and then you, you're staying in somebody's uh, um, Airbnb or whatever and you get to the end and there's a piece missing. And you think, why did I bother starting this, this episode? But it's that last piece that makes sense of the whole. Jesus is the fulfilment of all that's come before. Well, you can keep going through Matthew and I'm not going to go into all the details. I just want to take a couple more stops with you before we get to the end. And Matthew 10 is the next. In Matthew 10, Jesus sends the 12 out on a mission. And you can read of it in this chapter. The 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And listen to this. He says, do not go among the Gentiles. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel... And as you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So the 12 are given a mission, and the mission at this point is only to stay amongst the people of Israel. And that mission is a short mission. Uh, there are all kinds of particular instructions for how they're to do it and so on. And the, they're actually not only proclaiming a message, but we see in the following verses, they demonstrate the kingdom coming near. There's healings, there's driving out of demons... Um, there's all sorts of things taking place. Uh, come along a little bit further and there's an episode where John the Baptist is wondering whether he's got it right about Jesus uh, or not. And, um, of course, in the background of all of this, John the Baptist is imprisoned, um, he's beheaded, and we're wondering if he's the forerunner to Jesus, what might happen to Jesus. Well, a bit of a climax is reached in chapter 16, and in chapter 16, Jesus asks uh, his disciples who people say the Son of Man is. And there are various reports about him going around. Some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets. And they're reasonable guesses because of the kind of person he is. But then he says to them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Interesting that Simon Peter is given a perspective on Jesus that comes from God himself. Uh, he hasn't worked this out. Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So it's the right perspective on Jesus. Uh, whatever else they might have been saying, he is the Messiah. He's that son of David. He's the promised king. He's the anointed one who was to come, who would be the king who would rescue the people. And, and then Jesus says these words, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And back when we looked at that passage, one of the points that we, we, uh, we identified was that it's not Jesus changing topic, because it sounds a bit like it, doesn't it? Who, who am I? You're the Christ. 
oh, and by the way, you're Peter, and I'm going to build the church. No, it's, it's actually Jesus being identified to be the one who is the Christ. What would the Christ do? Well, he would build a house for God. Not a house of bricks and stone, but a house of people, uh, a kingdom, a dynasty. And so it's, it's like Jesus is identified and then his job description is revealed. And it's going to involve these people, people like Peter, people like the disciples. Come on a bit further. And um, we, we kind of struggled a little bit. Uh, well, if you didn't, um, good on you, because um, I did. I had to do a lot of work on these chapters, and, and I do every time I come to them in Matthew 24. And there are a number of things that were said uh, in this passage, 24, 25, where Jesus is just about to go to his betrayal and his death. And uh, some of the things are apocalyptic in nature, that is, there's kind of heavenly, cosmic um, opening of the curtains of heaven type stuff going on. And uh, I'd like to read to you, uh, just to remind you, verses that I've actually printed inside your handouts. Um, there are a couple of things that I'm going to draw attention to here, and they're printed inside the outline. Um, first of all, Matthew 24, 29 to 31. And, and I want you to notice the, the kind of time references and the people who are in focus. So immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then all the peoples on the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when we were looking at this, we saw that the key to understanding what's taking place has been shown by Jesus to be coming from the book of Daniel. The Son of Man coming in the book of Daniel. And you'll notice if you come down to verse uh, Daniel, verses, uh, chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Notice the direction. The Son of Man comes to God. And what happens? He's given authority, glory and sovereign power and all nations and people of every language worshipped him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So you're really working hard this afternoon and we're only at sub point one of the introduction. Okay? But to remind you, what's happening here is that after the distress, I take it the distress is the crucifixion of Jesus. After that, he is resurrected. He ascends to the Ancient of Days, uh, to God's right hand, where he is crowned the Lord over all, the sovereign king. He's coming into his kingdom. And then what happens? He's given authority, glory and sovereign power. And, and you see then, immediately after that, verse 31, back into Matthew, and he will send his angels, and the word angel, angelos, literally means messenger. He will send his messengers with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now, I want to say to you, I, th I think what we're getting to now in Matthew 28 is the point where the sovereign Son of Man will now send out his messengers to gather in those who belong to God. Well, that, that's uh, an introduction, um, laying the scene. Matthew, um, how is this then a climax? Well, let's read it again. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You see it there? He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. That's what Daniel promised. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And notice in Daniel, all nations and people of every language worshipped him. 
and then baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And again, Daniel, his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, his kingdom one that will never be destroyed. So I hope just by reading these things in this first point of what we're looking at, you can see what a fitting climax is these last few verses to Matthew's Gospel. Jesus, the promised one, has done all that God said he would do. And now the work of the disciples is to begin. The messengers. All right. Um, I'm going to move more quickly through all the following points. If I'd been laying this out according to the volume of time, you'd probably be halfway down the page already. That is unless I get excited by another topic and who knows. Um, I am excited by all of this, by the way. The next thing I'd like us to see um, is what a miserable kind of bunch of people are being commissioned. Um, they're weak and they're imperfect. I think there are two indicators to that. First of all, the 11 disciples. We're now introduced to the fact that now they are the 11 i.e. not the 12. There's already been a betrayal and a death. Um, this is only the 11. And then when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Um, amongst them, you've got worship, but you've also got doubt. Now, you might be thinking, okay, there's 11. Which are the ones who worshipped and which are the ones who doubted? I think probably a better translation, and I worked hard on this this afternoon, is that you could say, when they saw him, they worshipped him and they doubted. Now, I don't think it's, it's just describing two different groups of people. It could be, but I think it makes more sense to go, they worshipped him, but they still haven't got it all worked out yet. They, they've still got puzzles. I mean, what's going on? This is beyond their expectations. They're not perfect. But there's the point. God, in his sovereign grace, chooses imperfect disciples to do something which was planned before the creation of the world, and that is to bring people from all nations under the authority of Jesus. How extraordinary. The other thing that stands out in uh, this section is what a great commissioner we have. Um, this is not primarily a call to world evangelism. That, that's not the most significant thing in this passage. The most significant thing in this passage is Jesus. L look at it there. When they saw him, they worshipped. You only worship God. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus says. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. I mean, wow. Wow. And baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son, that's me, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded them. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's Jesus-focused. The last thing by way of introduction is where do we fit in this? Where do you and I fit? Um, I suspect that most of us put ourselves into this account as the disciples. As if Jesus is saying to you and to me, go therefore into all the world and make disciples. Um, now, we, we can argue theologically around this issue, but in terms of the passage itself, where do we fit? Are we in the passage? Is it speaking to us at all? Well, I think the closest place to fit us is in the nations. We are direct beneficiaries of the disciples' obedience to Jesus because it spread. It went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. It went around the area that we know as Greece and Turkey and it started to spread and it kept on spreading and eventually it came to Australia. We are the nations and we thank God that he chose to work through weak and imperfect disciples to take a message that has transformed the lives of people ever since. 
Don't worry, there will be an application for us, but I want to see what it's saying first. Okay, I'd like to focus then on what stands out in this passage, um, and we'll do this more quickly, because these really are words that have changed the world. And it's interesting, the repetition, and it's repetition in the original, not just the English, of the word all. And I've highlighted them there. All authority, all nations, all that I've commanded you, all the days. It's there again and again and again and again. And some commentators have said it's, it's kind of implicit in the middle as well. That is all of God, Father, Son and Spirit, although the word's not there. So what do we make of that? Well, this is a climax because Jesus is fulfilling the promise that the king would have all authority. That is, he would be the one that God would appoint to be the ruler of the universe. And the big deal about that is when we recognise that Jesus is the ruler of the universe, he's the ruler of all nations, he's the ruler of heaven itself and every aspect of this earth, every place, every culture, every language, every race, every government, every space of land, every development, Jesus is ruler over everything. The implications of that authority flow from it. Because Jesus has authority over everything, therefore, and there's something that follows from the therefore. Now, there's only one direct verb in the original. The direct verb that follows from Jesus having authority in heaven and earth um, is this, make disciples. That's the verb. And then you've got ways that making disciples gets worked out. There are three aspects. As you go, as you baptise, as you teach. So because Jesus has authority over all, he therefore calls upon his disciples to bring everybody, everywhere, under his authority. To highlight to them that he is the king and that the kingdom of heaven has come. To make disciples, it, it kind of means to, to bring them to school or to bring them to follow the rabbi, to, to get them to listen to Jesus. Because he has authority over the whole earth, therefore... There will be a grand or a great mission, a great commission for Jesus to send his disciples to call all people to get into line with reality. Because Jesus is the sovereign God. And so his disciples are given the responsibility of making disciples, not of them, but disciples of Jesus, like they are disciples of Jesus. See, the disciples are 11 people here who are living it now in the light of reality. That is, the God of the universe is with them and they've followed him. And that's the only right thing to do. It, it's logical, it's practical, it's eternal in its consequences. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, okay, now I want you to share this news so that people will be gathered from all nations. Baptising them, he says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, we could go down a rabbit hole on this one and we could talk a lot about what it means to baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, the word baptise isn't really a word. Um, it, it's, it's an English form of Greek letters. The, the Greek word is baptizo, I baptise. And instead of translating it, and you could translate it by a range of words, you could translate it as I, I dip, I plunge, I wash, I clean, I overwhelm. Um, it's a word that can be used of doing the dishes. It's a word that is often and most regularly used 
uh, around the New Testament and at other times in the ancient world as a, a washing associated with change. And, of course, John does so much washing that he gets known as John the Washer. That, that's what his name was. I mean, we, we are so used to hearing the word baptise and so used to him being John the Baptist and we've got a, an entire denomination that's been around for a few hundred years called Baptists that we, I think, can't read this without thinking of a particular kind of perspective on what's happening. But one third of the references to the word baptism in the first century, in the New Testament and in the surrounding literature, speak of baptism or washing as a metaphor. About two thirds of them are to do with liquid. So it's quite possible that what he's saying here could be read as washing them, immersing them, soaking them, plunging them, engaging them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It may or may not be talking about water in this verse. Interesting, a couple of things, and I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole. Um, if this is a direct command to baptise with water, saying the words in the name of the Father, the Son and the Spirit, it's quite extraordinary that you don't see that happening in the New Testament afterwards. You find all the baptisms in Acts to be in the name of Jesus or the Lord Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the Trinitarian formula is not used. But if you see it metaphorically as, I want you to get people from all nations and they're going to need to get soaked in this stuff about the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That is, they're going to need to come into a relationship with God as he is, Father, Son and Spirit. And that's going to be a really big deal. So next verse, you're going to have to teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. These aren't Jews that you're going to who've got the Old Testament. These are people who are coming to this fresh. People from Galatia, Colossae, Ephesus and so on. These are people who you need to unpack so much for them to understand. All right, I just wanted to kind of break up our immediately thinking that it's saying a particular thing as we approach this. What are they to be taught? Well, they're to be taught everything that Jesus commanded them. Um, I, I take it, again, that's not a literal, Jesus commanded them to go and set up the upper room and Jesus commanded them to get a donkey and its foal. Um, it, it's not so much the particular commands as just everything that Jesus was on about. Teach them that. And what was the main thing Jesus was on about? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And who was the king? Jesus. So there's a lot about himself. It's extraordinary when you read even these verses, but you go back and again and again and again, Jesus is, is making himself the focus in his teaching. Because he is the focus. And God has made him the focus, not himself. And then, notice he says, And behold, I am with you always, or all the days, in the original, to the end of the age. Um, here is the promise of Daniel 7 coming about. Uh, that is the one who has everlasting dominion. Here is God with us, Emmanuel, from the first chapter. And here I think, here I think is what brings us into the commission as subsequent disciples. See, what Jesus, I take it, is on about is multi-generational disciple-making disciples. Um, Jesus has in mind not just the period of 20 or 30 or 40 years, that is the time left for these 11. But the end of the age when he will return to wrap all things up. And so 
as someone has brought the message of the kingdom of heaven to us, and as we, um, from that person and presumably from the church community that they're a part of, have, have grown as disciples of Jesus, part of the intention of that discipleship is that we will in turn call other people to become disciples of Jesus. That, that we'll baptise them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That we'll teach them about Jesus and all that is said and done. I take it this is ultimately a call to Christians to be the people that God called, that Jesus called his first followers to be. That is his disciples. And that's why uh, here at Salt, we've got this tagline, growing followers of Jesus. Or you could say disciples of Jesus, because that's what it means. It's who we are. And it's what we're to do. It's a noun and it's a verb. Once we recognise who Jesus is, how could it be any other way? Jesus is not the Lord of Sundays. He's the Lord of every day. He's not the Lord of church gatherings. He's the Lord of whole communities. He's not the Lord of the USA or of Israel. No, he's the Lord of every tribe and people and language and culture and nation all across this globe, all through time. That's who Jesus is. So friends, having been introduced to Jesus through the gospel, Jesus has a claim on your life. If you don't know him personally, you can. And how extraordinary that you can know the one who God has made ruler over everything. Last week, um, just tell you this little story because it's kind of cute. Um, one of my grandkids was, uh, was down at Bells Beach watching the Australian uh, Surfing Championship with the dad. I think that was how he got there. But um, there was incredible access to the athletes, to the surfers. And they were just sending us all these photos like, of them with selfies with world champions you know, this person's had two world titles, this person's had ten, this person's had six, and so on. And there was a, a beautiful little video that we saw. Well, it's just a collage of photos, which has got... Um, I don't think she's world champion, but she's, she's certainly been uh, right up there on the world circuit, Sally Fitzgibbon, um, saying what, what surfing has given her... Uh, it's nice to be able to give back to others. And then you look at this little clip and there's a picture of her reaching out to this little boy and she's passing him uh, her shirt that she wore which had her name and number on it and written on it is, I've got your back always, um, such and such Connor, our little grandson. And there's a beam on his face. And he had that access for that moment to that person who will probably make him feel like a champion. We have access to the heavenly son of man. We've got access to the king of kings and the lord of lords. We've got access to the resurrected ruler of all eternity. We might feel like a fairly kind of small, irrelevant, outdated group as we gather together on Sundays... But we've got a direct line to the God over everything. And it is such good news. And aren't you glad that somebody shared it with you? We'll pay it forward. Pay it forward. Let somebody else know the good news. Pass it on to those around about. Be prepared to speak up. Pray for opportunities. Invest your time and your money and your gifts and your resources. 
into proclaiming the name of Jesus, of calling people to follow Jesus. Sometimes the Great Commission is given as though it's the only command in the Bible to make Jesus known and to go other places to do it. But it's not the only command. There is so much motivation to share Jesus with others. For God so loved the world. Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for us that we might not live any longer for ourselves but for him who died for us and was raised again. There's motivation. Paul says once he came to grips with the with the crucified and resurrected one, he could no longer be the same person. He was just compelled to live differently. We've been told again and again and again and again by Jesus. I think someone did account 46 times that there will be a judgment, that there is an eternity of loss for those who reject Jesus and there's an eternity of life for those who follow there's motivation. You take Jesus at his word, you don't need a direct command to go to all the nations. You've just got to care about the people around about us. Maybe they're members of our own families. Maybe they're the people living next door, people at work, people at school, people who just don't know that one day they will stand before Jesus and they'll give an account and if they've lived their life turning their back on Jesus, then Jesus will give them what they've asked for. And that is independence from him, and that is not good, and that will go on forever. So we need to persuade people that independence from Jesus is a mistake. Embrace Jesus, trust Jesus, turn to Jesus while you can. And here's another motivation, because you don't have all the time in the world. Yesterday was a brutal reminder as, as we mourned and as we just focused on the fact that, that our sister Ness at 58 has gone home to be with Jesus. We, we don't know the time that we have, friends. And good luck trying to predict it. And if we live as though we've got all the time in the world, then... We're actually, I was going to say, we're playing Russian roulette. But it's worse than that. We're actually thumbing our nose at God. Because God has warned us again and again and again that we don't have all the time in the world. He's patient. He's incredibly patient. He could come back at any time, Jesus. Like a thief in the night, it will say. And we'll look at that in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. Sorry, 1, yeah. But at the moment, his patience is giving people the opportunity to turn back to God. So whether it's the return of Jesus sometime in the future or whether it's our return to Jesus when we die, that's the future. That's a really clear future for everyone, for us, for everyone around about us. So... We can either bury our heads in the sand and think that it'll go away and it won't, or we can fill our minds and our lives and activities with trivia and distractions, but it won't change anything. But there's another motivation, and I think it's implicit in all of these. God made us for relationship with him. That's, that's where we work best. Um, we, we were created in God's image to walk with God and talk with God, to be guided by God and to be blessed by God. Only problem is we think that we'll do better without him and we're wrong. We're really wrong. We can't control ourselves, can't control our societies, can't control our world. I mean, I think that's the clearest truth of the Christian faith, 
the most simple thing to prove. All you've got to do is flick on your phone or turn on the news and you'll see what a good job we're doing of pushing God away. And so we, we've got a better story to share. We, we, we've got a true message that says God has made you for relationship with himself and if you will live in relationship with himself, then you will be living your best life now. Because you're made to live with God. Creature always lives best when it recognises its creator. God, our Father, us as his children. That's the way it's meant to be. So you are blessing people around you by sharing this good news. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story and I'll finish with this. Many of you, probably most of you will know that I, I live with lung cancer and, and a few years back I was told that I wouldn't live for very long. And it, it, I have and God's been very kind in that, but it, it made me quite passionate uh, about sharing the good news of Jesus with people who had cancer. And I, I started to gather a group of people together when I was in Canberra that might do this with me. And, and we, we were discussing... Uh, what was appropriate to do in, in caring for and loving people with cancer. And, and somebody said that they actually thought that it was probably a bit kind of mean of us when somebody is down, right, they've got a, you know, a serious diagnosis, to share the gospel in that context. You know, like as though, you know, you, you can share the gospel with people who are going well in life, that's okay because you know, they're not in any risk of kind of being manipulated or, or adopting something that they, they shouldn't. But if someone's vulnerable, then don't share the gospel with them. And I thought to myself, what, what, where did that come from? I mean, when somebody's vulnerable, isn't it great news? Great news to know that you can be right with God and that God will be with you and he'll never leave you nor forsake you and he wants your best and he'll bring it about. Well, um, that was a long introduction. That was a long conclusion. But you only gave me five verses so I had to do something with it. There you go. <laughs>